welcome to the fan of history previously on the fan of history in 911 bc the neo-assyrian empire begins and adad nirari ii went forth from asher the capital of assyria in northern iraq today to reconquer the empire the assyrians had lost in the 11th century bc so what happened in the years 909 to 900 bc I am the fan of history, but I'm just a fan of history. I'm not an historian. So I want to learn if you find any problems and errors, please let me know. Uh, please watch the videos, the great civilization of the worlds in 1000 BC and the, uh, the events of the 920s. Uh, there will be a great civilizations of the world in 900 BC video. It will probably be done very soon. So let's look at this. Uh, Adad Nirari II is the king of Assyria and he will do yearly campaigns to honor Asher. Our sources have improved a lot here. We have three different sources telling us of Adad Nirari. They're all Assyrian and they're all making him look really good. Adad Nirari has three main targets in these 10 years we're talking about here. He's going northwest to the Kabku and the Nairi lands to the northwest. He's going to Babylonia. Uh, or to the border of Babylonia at least. He's going to fight the Babylonians. He is also going to constantly have a problem with Arameans. Uh, he's trying to assimilate the Arameans. He tried to make them into traders and is beating them up. And eight of his campaigns in his reign will be directed against the Arameans. The main record is the royal record of Adad Nirari II. There are no non-Assyrian sources for this period. So uh, the sources are very, as I said, pro-Assyrian. The goal of Adad Nirari II is to restore the Middle Assyrian Empire that they lost. And I am going to make an, uh, a video about the early Neo-Assyrian army. So look for that on the channel. That will happen before we are done with the 9th century. In 909 BC, Adad Nirari goes to battle with the Sukku. I found very few sources about the Sukku. I assume they are Armenians. This is an uncertain year, also it could have happened later. But the Sukku are defeated and they will henceforth pay tribute to Asher. We haven't found anyone yet who just gives up when the Assyrian army shows up and pays the tribute, but that is an option. Uh, the way Adad Nirari fights is that after the harvest is in, he will gather everybody who is anything, give them state-of-the-art equipment, iron weapons, good armor. They had previous training, so they are the best fighters in the world. And then they go out and beat somebody up. And by the end of the campaign, they return to Heartland Assyria, happy with themselves. And we'll talk much more about Adad Nirari II in this episode. But first, let's go to Egypt. Egypt has a period of peace and prosperity. The pharaoh is Osorkon, the son of Shoshenk. He's the second pharaoh of the 22nd dynasty and he's a Libyan. Um, by uh, his family is Libyan, he's lived in Egypt all his life as did his father. At some point in this decade he gives an enormous amount of silver to the temple. This amount of silver is so enormous that it seems uh, untrue. But there is an indication that Egypt is extremely wealthy in this period. And that often happens. Egypt is often extremely wealthy. And as I said before, the four harvests a year you can get from the Nile is the source of so much wealth that you can manage Egypt really poorly and you'll still be really rich. Osorkon restores the Temple of Bastet at Bubastis and he builds a small Temple of Atum there. He also built an epic fortress which has not been found. And archaeologists are still looking for this place. Uh, he gives a statue of himself to the king of Byblos, Elibal. And Shoshenk, Osorkon's father, did the same thing to the father of Elibal. And Elibal is so happy about this uh, statue, and it actually is this statue that you see here. Uh, so he wrote his name on uh, the statue too. There seems to be a strong connection between the Phoenicians, the trading people of the Mediterranean, and uh, the pharaohs. So in 908, it's time to go to war again for Adad Nirari II. And this year is extremely uncertain. It could be 902 actually. 
Uh, but it's definitely not 9 10 that, uh, sta that is stated on this map, but it is this battle here. It is not within Babylonia, but it is on the border of Babylonia. Uh, Babylon is ruled by Shamash Mudamik still. And in this first battle between the two great powers of uh, Mesopotamia, uh, only one of them is a great power because Babylon is small and weak, and Babylon loses. And there is, uh, here it is in the words of Adad Nirari himself. He who brought about the defeat of Samas Mudamik, king of Kardonai, Kardonai is the Assyrian term for Babylon, from Yalman to the river Turan, from Lahiru to Ugarsalu, to the border of Assyria, all the land of the cultic city of Deir, I conquered Arafa and Lubdu, the fortresses of Kardonai, I added to Assyria. So, meanwhile, in India, we don't know a lot because the Indians are not writing things down for hundreds of years to come. We don't know anything. The Vedic tradition is very strong and it is believed that the Vedic texts are preserved by oral tradition. But, as we know, oral tradition is uncertain. It seems that uh, Jaina Valkya writes the Shatapa Brahmana around here, in which he describes the motion of the sun and the moon. Quite correctly, I might add. And the Vedas are around, new texts are being created, and we're definitely in the early, in the, the Vedic religion and the Vedic culture in India. Hopefully, we'll have a bit more to say about India in the next century. So, Adad Nirari goes to war again every year. We don't have a record of him not going to year. And actually, the Assyrians, it will be notable when they don't go to war. It is unclear which year he did what. Uh, he fought the Arameans and in the Kabku. The Kabku is here. This is the Nairi in Turkey and the Kabku is like the borderland between Turkey and Iraq today. The Kabku is a geographical term and it is on both the banks of the upper Tigris river. In the future this will be part of the Urartu kingdom but Urartu is not around yet. On Sri Lanka, the city of Anuradhapura is founded. The historical record actually says that the city is founded in the 5th century BC, but when archaeologists uh, did uh, their digs at Anuradhapura, Anuradhapura uh, they found that the city had been around since the 10th century BC. But we don't have any records of what's going on here, so we will return to Anuradhapura and the Sinhalese who lived there at a later date. So, Adad Nirari II, he records, he records his wars, he writes about war, the Assyrians are all obsessed about war, their main god Ashur is the god of war, but in their heart the Assyrians are partly traders and trade prospers under Assyrian power. Strangely enough, there is constant war, but there is also constant trade. And some of the Arameans become uh, peaceful traders. And actually Aramean traders and Phoenician traders prosper in this era. New trade routes are opened and uh, yeah, there are trade connections getting formed. And Assyrians overlook everything, tax it and are happy with it because they love trading. But in 901 BC, Adad Nirari comes up against the Temanites. The Temanites control the Kanilgalbat, which is a part of the old Mitanni Empire. This is the entire Yasira of today, but the area we are talking about is this area. It will be most uh, clearer on the next picture. This is east of the Kabu River, and the Assyrians want to take all the lands between the upper Tigris River and the upper here and the upper Euphrates River here. Euphrates. Uh, the Kabu River splits this land in two, so the first object is to take the land to the Kabu River. But this land is controlled by the powerful Temanite tribe, and they are most likely Arameans, but it is not certain. They have two strong leaders, Nur Adad and Mukuru, and these guys seem to control part of the land uh, by themselves, so they are not uh, controlling the same area. In this campaign, Adad Nirari II fights against Nur Adad of the Temanites. And the Assyrians always claim victory. If you look at 
Adad Nirai's records, he won this war, but he didn't defeat Nur Adad, and Nur Adad will be back. So it was probably a draw. In Peru, we have the Chavin culture. People are turning into jaguars and being amazed by it. And we are still far away from the high point of the Chavin. They have built very interesting things, but I will get back to those things later when it is more likely they are actually around. Because this is still quite early in the Chavin culture. North of uh, the Chavin, the Olmec live in Mexico and this time it's the end of San Lorenzo. San Lorenzo has been the capital or the main cult center of uh, the Olmec culture in Mexico for a long time, for many, many hundreds of years. But lately there's been a lot of problems. Uh, there has been warfare, environmental change, economic decline, other places uh, emerging and the rivers changed the courses. So at this point most people are giving up leaving San Lorenzo as a shadow of his former self and by this time La Venta to the east in the swamps much easier to defend becomes the center of Olmec culture. At its high point San Lorenzo was 700 hectares it had a drainage system sort of a sewer system you could get fresh spring water uh, uh, many places in the city and it seems to be something religious about this supply of water because it is really extensive uh, let's jump ahead here. The Maya have been around for almost a thousand years, but they still live in the shadow of the Olmecs. But they are migrating into the lowlands of the Yucatan Peninsula. And you see how close it is to the Olmec heartland. They will grow beans, maize, chili peppers and squash. And uh, they, they're influenced by the Olmecs. They look at the Olmecs, they learn from the Olmecs and they, it's uh, growing. But it's still over a thousand years left until the Maya reached their high point. So in 900 BC, Adad Nirari returns to Nur Adad's and the Temanites and the lands they control and fights Nur Adad again. It seems that Nur Adad's capital is called Nasibina, also known as Nisibis or Nusaybin. It's up here, it's in today's Turkey. And here Adad Nirari's armies are coming up. But they cannot, they don't reach the capital and totally victory eludes the Assyrians. But we can assume the Temanites are driven back and hurt. One of these Assyrian armies at this time probably numbers around 20 to 30,000 guys. Well trained, good equipment etc. The Arameans simply can't resist this in the long run. It's possible that uh, Nur Adad got help from Mukuru, the other leader of the Temanites to keep the Assyrians at bay, but how long, how long can the Temanites stand against the Assyrian menace? So something is actually going on in Europe. It's the Villanovans. Uh, the Villanovans is the first uh, European culture outside of Greek. And uh, they are the precursors of the Etruscans, or are they? We'll talk more about that. Remember also that there are already Latins living on the Palatine Hill. Um, er, the early history of Rome is such a mess and clouded in legend that I will not really talk about Rome before 616 BC. So the Villanovans, uh, they are the earliest Iron Age culture in Italy. They quite abruptly follow the Bronze Age Terramare culture, so they might have conquered them. Uh, they are followed by the Etruscans and it's, the break is not as abrupt. Uh, they seem to have their origin in the Urnfield culture. And they, when they die, they are, placed in, they are burned, placed in urns and then buried. The question of Etruscan origin is a mystery and we'll get back to that. But it seems that the Villanovans have uh, a, an Indo-European image language. They, for example, have swastikas just like in Vedic India. Uh, they seem to have contact with the Hellenic civilization and early Villanovan culture has been around for 200 years but this is the classic Villanovan phase and it turns into civilization there and that's why I mention it now because I'm talking mainly about historic civilizations. 
they are trading to the north along the Amber Road. And I'll, I'll talk more about the Amber Road in the 9th century BC. So in 900 BC, the King Gong of China, he dies. He's succeeded by his son, King Ji. You know very little of Gong, but a little more about Ji. And China is now turning very poorly documented. I may talk a bit about uh, the Sioux capital of the Western Sioux. Uh, in a later episode, but I want to mention that King Gong had a brother called King uh, called Chao, and uh, he is the uncle of little King Ji, and he seems to have some nasty plans. Around 900 BC, the Lapita culture has have reached the uh, Samoan Islands. They are this seafaring culture in the Pacific. They get everywhere in their very primitive canoes. And these are the Samoan Islands. Or are these the Samoan Islands? Some of these islands they have now reached. We don't have any written records of them, but I still wanted to mention them because their feet is amazing. And they cannot find New Zealand. Also around this time, the Nok culture arises in Nigeria. Uh, this is, coincides with the Bantu expansion that we have talked about earlier, which is interesting. The Nok culture vanishes under unknown circumstances in 300 AD, so they're around for uh, over a thousand years. They are the earliest sub-Saharan producer of life-size terracotta, and their sculptures are quite amazing. They get iron in about 550 BC, and they don't have any written records. So we don't know a lot about them. They, uh, it's actually less than 100 years since this culture was discovered. So if you know anything more about the Nok culture, please share with me. In the next episode, we'll talk about the 890s BC. Adad Nirari will face Babylonia again, now under new management. He will also fight the Tamanites. And uh, yeah, in China, stuff will happen. And eventually Adad Nirari II will die of old age actually. Very few Assyrian kings die in battle. We'll talk more about that later. The 890s episode will be released on May the 26th. I will do this weekly report, uh, this decade reports every week. You can discuss the show with me on YouTube or on Facebook. Please check out the Facebook page. Please subscribe to this channel. Please like, please share this, it helps to keep me going. And I've been thinking about doing this as a podcast too on iTunes, but uh, yeah, any encouragement might uh, make me do that. So thank you for watching and see you next time when we get to the 890s BC.